museum director on there. He replaced our longtime director, Rick Pratt, with it. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming here tonight. And, and like Cliff said, it, it's an area of interest right now for Port Aransas. And I'm going to be talking just about the history of the port, how we got to where we are today, not where we're going to be going uh, in the future. And on this first slide, as I was doing the work for it, that's a picture of Guthrie Ford. And, and Guthrie was a, a great friend of Port Aransas. He wrote a lot about our history on there. He passed away last year uh, from the museum, uh, instrumental in getting it going. And I know all of us at Pop Up miss him and uh, thank he, he for all that he did to keep the history of Port Aransas alive. Now, the ports. So, looking at history, you always look back on there and, and different times. So, 200 years ago when this area was first being settled, you had three basic modes of transportation. For a, that, That's the size of a vessel that would have been coming in there, 50 to 100 tons. What would it be doing? Where would it go inland from there? If you were going to Mexico, you'd be taking a pack train of uh, mules. If uh, another was the cartera, that's ox. And we're so used to, I came from Flower Bluff today, it took me 30 minutes to get here. If you were transporting by an ox, it's two miles an hour. <laughs> uh, if, if you're making a trip to San Antonio, if you're taking goods to San Antonio or back, that's a five to seven day journey. Uh, the mules, the pack mules there, the ore, not the ores, but the lead and, and things that came out of Mexico, they packed them up on mules. And we're talking weeks on this journey where you're camping out, you have to take everything with you, you need protection because of the Indians. 200 years ago, that's what we were looking at. So. Here, here's our area. We have Corpus Christi Bay on the left. You've got San Antonio Bay on, on the right. In the middle is what we call Port Aransas today and, and the Aransas Pass with it. And, and this is a current photo, so it's uh, with it. Okay, Jim. And settlement, the first settlement in this area was up there in Copano. That's an abandoned town uh, now. There's just a few traces. It's on private land. And the uh, Spanish, uh, it was part of New, Sp New Spain at the time. They developed it and they, the boats came in. They came through the Aransas Pass, took that right turn over into Copano. And a, and a sailboat, it'll go four to six miles an hour, a lot faster than the mules or the ox on there, and, and if you had 100 tons on there, a, a big boat, that would be about uh, 200 oxen or 400 mules with it. Uh, okay, the next, Texas is, is starting to get going, Aransas City. It, as we talk about here, Aransas is, is a common name on here. So that was 1937. That's, Copano was serving uh, South Texas, Refugio, the McGloin uh, settlements with, with the settlement that was coming in from Ireland, uh, primary Irish settlements, but also in the United States. Then in 19, or 1837, Aransas City was formed. Corpus Christi, 1838. 1839, Lamar. 1844, now Aransas, like I say, is a common name. So you had Aransas City over there, and then that's just, just Aransas. Now it's on the backside of St. Joe's Island. It wasn't in what we call Port Aransas today. Um, 1867, Rockport. But Rockport, uh, around 1890, changed their name to Aransas Pass. Then... 1892, they changed it back to Rockport because that's when Aransas Pass was formed uh, then. So uh, again, the common denominators to the right of Aransas is Aransas County. And, and we here in Port Aransas, what we call the ship channel is in the Aransas Pass. So it's not in Aransas County. 
It's not in Aransas Pass. It's not in Rockport or Aransas Pass. It's not in Aransas City. It's in Port Aransas. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Now, at at that time, so this is a Civil War map, and if you look to the left, all the stars on that, that is called Fort Sims. There was no Port Aransas. It was just Mustang Island, and this was... You had a few settlers that were uh, bar pilots. Most of them lived on St. Joe rather than uh, Mustang Island. And this was the first kind of organization. So there was all of those represent where the Confederate uh, cannons are. But you see the dotted lines coming in. When ships would come in, that's... They would follow those dotted lines coming in there. Up on the top, you see that right here, that's where the lighthouse was. And in those days, you look at the lighthouse now, and it's out just in the middle of nowhere. Why did they put a lighthouse there? Well, when they built the lighthouse, you could see the channel coming from it. And what's happened is over time, the island has receded here. And on this map now, what we think of Port Aransas is right here. Getting here was very tough by ship. This is the uh, SS Mary. This is part of the Morgan steam lines. Before the jetties were built, when the channel looked like that, it wrecked in 1876. And shipwrecks were quite often. There was one day, there were three of them. If the weather was bad, on there, uh, it was tough coming in. And to give you an example, this is Cavallo Pass. This is current pictures. But uh, the top picture, that was taken in 1916. And then you look at the bottom, which was taken in 1970. That that was taken in 2016, and and the bottom was taken in, in 2017. And you can see all the shifts that are going on. Nothing's ever the same. So if you're a ship captain coming here from Galveston or New Orleans or something like that, that pass always changed. And look, looking at the breakers up there, you can see where the, it's breaking. Well, those sandbars, they're moving constantly. That's why you had the shipwrecks. The water was only five to nine foot deep. You were very limited, and it was only in a small area and always changing. Navigation into South Texas was tough. If you wanted to get to Corpus Christi, we all look out there and look at the ship channel. Well, there was, the ship channel, there was nothing there. That's how you did. You, had, you went in, you went to Liddy Ann like you're going to Rockport. You go halfway to Rockport, you cut across uh, through Redfish Bay, and that was a real windy... A uh, hard channel to get on there, and if you're sailing on there, it was nar- narrow, very difficult. And the thing that really changed it, so you had shipwrecks. You could only get shallow draft boats in five to seven feet on there, getting the channel stabilized. And to do it, you had to put jetties in with it. Uh, on there. And the jetty system, this was the big change in the 19th century for Port Aransas on there. And in the first section on there, this started in the 1870s. And, uh, whoa, Jim. So, this was called the government jetty right here. You saw that other slide, so you would come in like this. And they put this jetty in, and I think, uh, well, it was 1885 when it was completed. And they hardened that shoreline uh, right there. Okay. That, that was done in 1885. Then, then in 1896, uh, the federal government paid uh, for the government uh, jetty on there. I, I got Getty on there. I, I'm thinking of the rich guy Getty. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> And, and it took years. They worked on that for nine years, and the government was very parsimonious, the federal government, with, with doing it. You can see the direction. Well, they, they cut a deal in, in 1890 with the Alex Brown and Company. This is an uh, investment firm 
out of Baltimore, uh, Maryland. And what Brown said, if we can charge a toll on every ship that comes in, we will build the jetties. Government said, that's fine with it. Uh, that's great. And said, well, the government, the contract will give you 10 years. And what you have to do is you have to have a channel depth of 20 feet. Now remember, Port Aransas was five to nine feet. This is the first deep water. 20 feet means real ships, sailing ships can come in. Just a huge deal on there. And the guy named Hop, he called it a reaction breakwater. And he had an idea is if I don't connect it to the shoreline, the currents are going to come through. <laughs> They'll come through here, sweep out, and keep that water 20 feet of depth on there. So we save money on the jetties. And uh, everything, I look like I'm a real smart, cool guy with it. And he was a great engineer, designed the jetty system out at, at New Orleans and, and things. Well, contract's in, 10 years is up, and the bar depth is 18 feet. Alex Brown has uh, sunk about a million dollars in here, and, and the government said, I'm sorry, but they're ours now. You can't charge a toll with it. And, and part of that, they took, they took that other jetty out, the old government jetty on there. But they didn't remove all the rocks. And so when you have dredging and stuff, it was always an issue. But later in uh, 1908, they did the South Jetty. And they also, the government came back with the abandonment of the, of the hop, they extended the jetty. You know, it needs to go all the way to the land, so they did the south jetty. They extended the shore. And then uh, 1919, they finished up and extended uh, the jetties to where we are today. So when you all go look at that jetty system, that was finished in 1919, 100 years ago. You're walking on those jetties, and you're walking. Now, they've been maintained and things like that, but there's 100 years on the South Jetty of history, the, the hop uh, is 120, 122 years. So when I'm talking about these engineers and builders, they, they knew what they were doing with it. Oh, okay, Jim. And then the last thing they did, the blue line up there, that represents, uh, they made a, a stone revetment so when storms came through, that uh, it would prevent the uh, St. Joe's from breaking th through. And, and you look on that, the blue line, and just down on the right, you see three orange deals there. Those are barges that were washed up there during Hurricane Harvey. So they were right about the revetment. When it, it breaks through, it, it does break through on it. And that was completed at that same time. Uh, what they were gunning for is all of this was coming in the 1890, uh, 1890s. This was the dream. So here was Harbor Island uh, on there, and you're, you're going up on the right-hand side. You're going to Rockport. You see uh, down, down there where the heavy brown lines are. That, that's just, if you look out there, that's looking toward the uh, lighthouse. That, that's just lowlands and things like that. They planned for those to be slips, and the lines going into them were uh, a railroad, and that was, that was the terminal railroad. Everybody was excited about that. We're going to have a deep water port. We're going to be able to compete against Port Aransas uh, on there, and they actually built the railroad up at the top where it goes to the, to the land, and that's, it stopped there, and that's... The, that railroad, they hauled the rocks out to build the jetties on that railroad, then they loaded them on a barge. So that's the uh, furthest that th this dream got along. 1902, John Nance Garner. Uh, John Garner was born in Uvalde, Texas. When he was 28 years old, he was elected county judge. Then he went to the Texas legislature. He served for two terms there, and then 1902, uh, he went to the U.S. Congress. He represented this area with it. 
And he was a classic politician. When you talk about pork, John Nance Garner was the best in pork. This, everything in the 19th century, getting the jetties, getting anything done, we couldn't get anything out of the government. And, and John Nance Garner, later on, he became the majority leader in the U.S. House. Then he was the Speaker of the House. Then, after that, he was uh, President Roosevelt's first vice president. And after two terms with Roosevelt, he thought Roosevelt was going to uh, uh, not go for re-election like every president up to him had done. And he was, going to, he was the presumptive nominee for the next president of the United States. That's how powerful this guy was. Well, Roosevelt decided to uh, run again, and uh, Cactus Jack went to his ranch in Uvalde and got out of politics. He advised President Truman, but he represented Port Aransas, Corpus Christi in this area, and he's the one that started making things happen. The jetties that we just talked about, the heavy lifting on the jetties, that came, those appropriations were done, John Nance Garner. Okay. One more, Jim. In 1909, the first, we had no deep water at that time. They're working on the jetties. Port Aransas was just starting to get going with it. This is the first appropriation the Cactus Jack got, the Turtle Cove Channel. Again, that area right there where the channel is used to just be mud flats. And I showed that slide where you had to go way around. Well, 1909, they dredged this channel. That way, uh, ships or small vessels could go straight to Corpus Christi without going that torturous route. Keep, no, other way, Jim. One more. 1912. This was a huge thing that Allen and Company, even though they got burned before, they decided to invest in Harbor Island. It changed the landscape forever on there. So this time they made a deal with the state, and what the state said, uh, if you build the docking facilities, we'll give you land. What we see is Harbor Island today, and the strip that goes all the way to Aransas Pass, that was part of the deal. Not build a channel, not uh, do the jetties, but just put in a harbor on there with it. 1912, the Turtle Cove Channel, the appropriation was done to take it for 12 feet, but also, here's the big thing, the Port Aransas Channel. What, what we are in today with it, what, keep on going. 20 feet. So that, that channel was completed in 1913, 20 feet deep. And the Aransas Pass channel was 12 feet deep going to Aransas Pass. But there's a lot of difference in a boat that comes in. It's a boat at 8 feet. It's a ship at 20 feet. So Harbor Island at that point in time started to compete against Galveston. Up to this point in time, no place in South Texas had dependable deep water or that you could go in uh, safely on it. In 1917, Cactus Jack got another appropriation, got it taken down to 22 feet. He's still working in 1920. He got it taken down to 20 feet on there. 1926, Corpus Christi Ship Channel. There were three uh, areas looking for the ship channel. This was after the 1919 storm, Aransas Pass, Rockport, and Corpus Christi. Well, Bob Clayburg, who was the son-in-law of Richard King, lived in Corpus Christi. Uh, John Kennedy, the uh, son of Mifflin King, or uh, Mif Mifflin Kennedy, of the Kennedy Ranch, he lived in Corpus Christi. Uh, most of uh, Cactus Jack's votes came out of Corpus Christi, and guess what? Surprise, surprise, Corpus Christi got the appropriations for the channel with it. And, and this, this was 19, actually 1926, it was dredged to 25 feet. 1930, it was taken to 30 feet. 1943, 34 feet. 
1959, 36 feet, 1965, 40 feet, and 1989, 45 feet. Now, and, and they deepened it all the way to the Gulf. But using those existing jetties that were completed in uh, 1906 to 1919, they were able to do all of this with it. But when, when the Corpus Christi Channel was done, Port Harbor Island went down. This was 1912. So deep water celebration, 1912. Aransas Pass. Uh, this picture was taken in Aransas Pass. Just, just a huge deal. For a, you know, almost 100 years, this area was looking for dependable deep water. And uh, you know, they ran the channel to the end of the Aransas Pass. And that's what made the city. Ar Ar Aransas Pass, that's when they were formed. So it was a brand new city. But they're already starting. Good Texans are already starting to party. Uh, this is the wharf. This wharf, as you go across the ferry, you get off on the other side or, uh, with it. And, and if you look to your right on there, this, this, would, this was located on the Aransas Pass Channel, but it was dredged to the, to the 20 feet. So uh, when I'm saying wharf, I mean, that's, that's the warehouse for it. So this picture was taken about 1911. You can see the size of it. it it's, it's good size. Alex Brown and Company. There's the completed wharf. This picture was probably taken about... 1918, that's a steam-driven tug on there, so I, the, the name of it is, is Alex Brown. And the ship uh, up there, you see the mast going up, it's still got the standing rigging. That, that's a sailing ship sitting there at the wharf. And here, there's the finished wharf, there's the ships coming in. And in the far right corner is what we call Port Aransas on there. You see the rail tracks as part of this uh, everything done then at that point in time was done by rail. So you, you brought your goods in. That's the San Antonio and Aransas Pass Railway. Well, the San Antonio and Aransas Pass Railway didn't come to the Aransas Pass. It went to Rockport. <laughs> the Harbor Island Terminal Railway Came, came to here. So you got off of the San Antonio and Aransas Pass Railway that went to Rockport and got on the terminal railway here. This was a cotton compress. And in, in that time, looking back, that train there is going back to Aransas Pass. And Texas was the largest producer of cotton and produced over four million bales a year. They were shipping about a million bales out of uh, Galveston. And back one, Jim. And the big reason for that port was cotton. Cotton truly was king. That was a cash crop with it. Uh, more cotton was shipped out of Galveston than any other uh, port in the nation. It, it wasn't the South, but it, it was in Texas. And the thing, Alex Brown, the Baltimore people, they're saying, well, a million bales a year going out of Galveston, and if we build this, it's cheaper for 400,000 of that million to go through Port Aransas. That was what got the port there, cotton. And this is a picture just after the port opened. It's taken from kind of where the ferry, well, it, it would be... Uh, closer to the Roberts Point Park, but looking across at Harbor Island there. And on the right, you see the, uh, the warehouses. That's a water tank right there. On the left, uh, that, that was a fuel tank. Now, this is a picture taken looking back towards Port Aransas on there. You can see the ships in the background, the, the cotton, all the bales of cotton sitting there at the warehouse uh, waiting to be loaded up. There's a line that's flat car, rail cars coming in there. Well, guess what? We had a port. Well, we have oil. And this, steam, this is a steam-driven pump, a Magnolia Oil Company, for uh, pumping oil on there. And you see a few oil cars right there at the top. So 
cotton's coming in from the mainland. Well, guess what? This is Texas, but that point in time, that was all coming from Mexico into Texas, not going out. Port Aransas was originally an import port on there. Another activity that took place, so on the right-hand side, that, that's the uh, cotton compress. And they're building concrete ships. And those are the farms to the left. And, and a, a little bit of perspective, here's a man right here. So that's a bit of the size. This was 1917. The United States was at war. One thing that there wasn't very much of was steel. So somebody had the bright idea, let's build concrete ships. Where were they built? Port Aransas, Harbor Island. This is the actual whole section of it. They, they poured it in sections and then kind of glued them all together. You can see the workers. There were about 500 people working at that point in time on Harbor Island building these concrete ships. Here's the end result. This is the Durham on there, and it's just been launched. It was a sideways launch. You can see the guy walking in the water with it. And, and they completed two of these. Well, the war ended uh, there, so you know there's better ways to build a ship than out of concrete. <laughs> and, and the outfit that uh, designed them specialized in building grain silos. So we've got a lot of folks here from the Midwest, and I mean, they were out of Chicago, and they did a great job on grain silos. And they did the engineering on the ships. Well, there's a difference between a ship and a grain silo. And if you put a grain silo on like that, down on the ground, and put a motor on the end, it doesn't travel very well. So where they had their rudders on there and their engines, uh, they, they were bringing crude oil, or bringing oil out of Veracruz in, in Tampico. And I read one of the captains, the, the first load, he got into rough weather, and he said it was the scariest thing that he ever did. The ship, it, it had two 180 horsepower motors in it. Now, this is almost 400 feet long, made out of concrete. You take some of those boats that are going out, uh, twin 180 outboards on it. Well, it, it couldn't get steerage way. It was just rocking and rolling in the Gulf. You see those rounded sides. You couldn't get from the, uh, the bridge up there to the forecastle with it, and he said, never again. Now, this, this ship is the Durham. It's still resting in, uh, off of St. Joe's Island. It uh, sunk, it, well, it, it landed off there in, in the 1930s. So, uh, you know. We were, Port Aransas was in the forefront of concrete shipbuilding. Too bad it wasn't much of a front. <laughs> and and th this, this was the heyday at this point in time. So Harbor Island was cooking. Cotton, they were shipping cotton out there. They were uh, sh uh, bringing in pipe, other, other type of dry goods on there. Oil was coming in with it. You, you had the shipbuilding on there, and Port Aransas is named. So Port Aransas was always known as Mustang Island. And we had the Confederates, Fort Sims. Uh, so then there was Fort Sims. And then 1864, uh, the Union came in. They landed uh, at, at Packery Channel. They marched on up, or maybe in 1863. Uh, to Fort Sims, and we had that it was Iowa and, and the Maine on our first winter Texans. And uh, they, they got up to the fort, and you know, it, it hadn't been that long against, it was 27 years before they had the Alamo on there, and uh, those Confederate soldiers, they looked out there and they saw all those ranks of blue coats on there, and they, they remembered the Alamo, put up the white flag, and uh, <laughs> we don't want to go through that again. One guy had his uh, raised the flag and, and the Union shot him, but that, that was the total casualties in the Battle of Fort Sims with it. Well, then, as the Union took over, they renamed it Post Aransas. That's the first time where we're starting to get closer on the name with it. So we went Mustang Island, Fort Sims, po Post Aransas on there. 
Then uh, they left in, in 1864. The island kind of went back. The only people that lived here were the uh, harbor pilots uh, on there, a few uh, subsistence uh, fishermen with it. And then in the 1880s, sports fishing got popular, tarp and stuff like that, uh, the hunting here. So we started getting a little bit more. The tarpon inn was built, but I didn't bring it with me. There were 10 property owners in total in Port Aransas in 1907. That, that was it. Now, you had a lot of people squatting. So uh, back then, it, uh, the state owned a lot of the land on there, and uh, that wasn't the population. It was about 50. But you had the tarpon in, but it was still... So you went... At one point in time, they tried using the name Star for Port, uh, Port Aransas. That didn't catch. And then, once tarpon fishing started, they started Tarpon, Texas with it. So that, that was the name. And we had a, a developer come. He came to Corpus Christi. He was a uh, Civil War vet, Elihu Ropes. And he thought, man, this is the greatest area around in the world. And he, he bought a lot of land around Corpus Christi. He bought uh, Mustang Island. He had grand plans on it. And uh, he was going to put a port, not here, but down where, close to where the uh, Mayan princess is. And he actually built a channel across there, paid for out of his pocket. It wasn't much of a channel. The jetties, they called them toy jetties on there uh, with it. But Port or the, the area wasn't, you know, the name Port Aransas wasn't even there. And they, so they changed the name of the community to Ropesville in, in honor of Elihu Ropes. Well, he, he was long on uh, talk and short on uh, capital with it. And... Uh, he raised a lot of local money on there, and in, in Corpus, it was called a ropes boom. It was a speculator's boom. Land went up a uh, hundredfold in price. And one of my uh, relatives invested, Matt Dunn, uh, my son's name Matt, but anyway, he invested in, in it. And then, like a lot of things in developing, uh, things went south, and uh, ropes ran out of money, people quit uh, giving him money and uh, things, and the uh, price of land collapsed. And uh, my, uh, th this was a, a great uncle, Matt. He went and uh, expressed his disappointment uh, with uh, Colonel Ropes, and, and Colonel Ropes was never higher than a lieutenant, but he called himself Colonel Ropes. And you know, uh, hey, my investment isn't too good. And he, he kind of, rather than saying it verbally, he uh, used his cane to. Uh, uh, get his points across on there, and uh, Colonel Ropes uh, filed charges against him, but uh, since he uh, snookered about half of Corpus Christi on there, and then my family, the Dunn family, was about 3% of the total population, he ended up going to New York never to come back, and uh, Matt Dunn didn't get any money back, but he got a little satisfaction. Uh, but Cur Colonel Ropes, so then the name was changed to Ropesville. Well, Ropes is gone, so the name went Tarpon, and, and that was the post office uh, down here. The name went back to Tarpon. Well, around 1909, something around there, the jetties are being built. They're, they're getting ready to dredge. The town is really taken off on there. The town was formed, Port Aransas, in 1911 uh, with it. And on the, the Port Aransas post, the title talks about deep water is here with it. And it, it really just came, this picture was probably 1916 on there. So if we would have had a, a picture even 15 years before, there would have been a, a few just small things. The, the tarpon end, not the current tarpon end, but uh, the predecessor tarpon end would have been the one big structure on it. But you can see this is a real town here. You've got the brick buildings and if we'd look to the right, I, uh, you know, the photographer would have taken a bigger view. There's, there's still more going on with it. And, the, and there was other industry. This is a fishery on it. So it would be on the backside of St. Joe's with it. Another part of the, this picture was also taken in 1916. And we all think in the Gulf of Mexico of, of uh, shrimp being the big producer. There are more menhaden caught in the Gulf of Mexico than all the other fish and uh, 
combined with it. The a annual take right now is about 500,000 tons a year with it. Well, what do they do with menhaden? They make fish oil uh, with it, and they also uh, make meal out of it. That's why you don't hear much of menhaden. It, this is the port, again, in that same time period. You, you can see that's a six-masted six schooner. It's obviously got a uh, steam engine in it for going in and out. There's the Alex Brown, the tugboat ahead of it with it. You've got a regular steamer sitting there, and that, that park's on the left. This was kind of the front door. This is the Roberts Point Park, what Port Aransas looked like in 1916. It's just mud flats. Uh, this is back to the Menhaden fishery on there. To the left is the pilot boy. Uh, pilot boy. That's a ship that uh, uh, went from Galveston to Corpus. It was a regular freight line. It, it would call some on um, uh, New Orleans. And to date it, that, uh, the pilot boy uh, was lost in the 1916 storm, which I think was August 23rd. So this picture was taken before that. And, and that's, that's a sad story on it, uh, the captain, and there were six-man crew, and, and uh, uh, three drowned. And, and one of the crewmen, they, uh, a lot of times these boats, they had pets, whether they be dogs or cats, and, and had a pet cat. And he went back to save the cat uh, on it. And when they found the body, it had all the scratches and everything else. He, you know, the cats don't like water. And they particularly don't like hurricanes, but, uh, you know, he, he gave his life for the cat, of a cat, and it didn't work out because the cat didn't make it either. So, this is another picture. You can see the oil tanks to the, uh, the fish oil tanks to the right. You can imagine what that place smelled like. Now, oil. So, Harbor Island was built on cotton. But being Texas, oil came... Uh, pretty close. So uh, you, you had the guys pouring concrete ships. Well, a concrete tank makes a lot more sense than that. So the first oil tanks were actually built out of concrete on there with it. And the port was bustling. Things were good on there. One, one problem, though, is, is the cotton shipments went down when uh, the United States entered uh, uh, World War I because they said, well, we're, uh, we need war goods on there, not cotton, but we still had good trade and, and pipe and, and other things with it. And there was a storm in 1916. And as you go back through the history, they, they talk about Port Aransas. And, and the GLO sent, sold some land here in 1907, what we know as Port Aransas today. They sold it all, all the way out to Access Road 1. And in their brochure, come by this, this land, they say, Port Aransas is safe. It's outside of the storm currents. They're talking about hurricanes. No problems here, because Galveston, they, you know, 1900, they had a, a, another bad storm in 1909. Indianola was two, two storms on there. So the prevailing thought was, down here, those storm currents, they all run them up, up there. Well, 1916 proved that we weren't outside of the storm currents. That was a Cat 4 storm that uh, made landfall opposite uh, Kingsville, Texas on there. And, and it did some damage here, but not, not that much. But the railroad tracks coming in, uh, they're low. They were only about two feet above water. So it washed them out, but the uh, other facilities were okay. But it, it, it cut them back, and they had to spend a fair amount of money fixing that back up and kind of did them well. It's like uh, Harvey, you know, 47 years uh, after Celia. Well, 1919 was three years after the 1916 storm. And, and it, it struck dead on. And uh, the 1919 storm was one of the worst national disasters in the nation. Uh, you had over 300 people die in that storm, about five in Port Aransas. I think there were 286 counted on there, not the missing in, in Corpus Christi with it. Well, the port was developing on there, and, and we had oil already coming in at, at that time. We had oil at Harbor Island. We also had oil on this side with it, uh, Gulf Oil, the Texas company, which Texaco now, and there was uh, three points of entry, and this was oil coming in again from Mexico. 
They, they would ship it out. It, it'd go as far as El Paso and, and Arizona. Well, that dark object to the left, that's an oil tank. And that oil tank came from where UT is today. And on the right, that's the Port Aransas School. And so that, that shows you the power of the storm. And, and the Port Aransas School was someplace, it was a long distance from the oil tank uh, on it. And, and just absolutely devastating. The warehouse that I showed you on there, it was gone. The cotton pr uh, compress, it was gone. The tracks, the rail tracks coming in, it was gone. That's why the federal government decided there needs to be someplace else to put a port besides Port Aransas. Two storms right in a row. Corpus Christi has 30 feet high ground. It's, it's a little bit storm-proof besides John Nance Garner. So 1920, we're bringing oil in. And, and these, these were the uh, outfits that were actually importing oil. Uh, to Harbor Island in, in 1920 uh, with it. The Mexican Petroleum Company was based in the United States. Uh, France and uh, Canada Oil Transport, they owned those uh, good old concrete ships. Uh, guess what? They were bankrupt in a couple of years with it. But, uh, you know, this just shows, uh, you know, it was an oil port. And... They got the train tracks going back. The port went, the main port went to Corpus Christi on there. So here you got infrastructure on there. They, they 1919 storm, they rebuilt, rebuilt the tracks in, in 1922 with it. And what else can we do with it? And uh, they put cars. Now, now these are people coming to the beach for the, you would go to Ranzas Pass, you'd drive your car on the uh, flat cars, and they would come over to where the ferry landing is, close to it today, unload the flat cars on there, then you'd get on the ferry, come on over. Uh, Bill, Dr. Barron's, Bill Barron's here, is, uh, he's got a paper on this that uh, talks about that uh, with the museum. So that was kind of the transitioning uh, in there, but oil still was working, and, and this was 1956, so you see all the dots on there. Those, those are tanks, and those tanks, uh, they're little dots on here, but they're about 140 uh, feet wide, 50 feet uh, tall with it. The ferry landing is right here. So you coming here, coming right over there. This is a ship coming in to, uh, uh, so, so we were importing oil, and in the 1920s is when they really started finding oil in, in Texas. And, and the Tom O'Connor field, which is in uh, Refugio, Refugio County on there, once that was discovered, a huge oil field, and they, that's when oil started going the other way. So if you're bringing it in, it's just as easy to send it back out. So Port Aransas changed at that point in time from being an oil importing port to an oil exporting port. And it did that up into the 1960s. And this, uh, back one, Jim. Well, th this is Harbor Island. Uh, well, th this is the uh, Atlantic, uh, I forgot, it's a uh, navigator on there. And this ship was built in 1951. At the time it was built, it was the largest tanker in, in the United States. So when we talk about this, uh, there's nothing new. That's Harbor Island to the left. The tanks don't look that big because the ship is, is that big. And it, we were still exporting. This, this is a picture of the Harbor Island facility when they're pumping all the oil. You'll see the tanks on the left side. There was a little bit of community there. There's the old water tower. That was the one thing that was able to last through the storms of Alex Brown and company. Now, this is just a better picture on there. Th this one was taken in 1964. You, you see at that point in time, the Harbor Island was still up and, and going on it. Uh, you, there's about 3 million uh, barrels of uh, crude storage sitting there. Uh, 1995, the tanks were all still there when we were building Pioneer 
Uh, that, that's when we first started building it. That's what Harbor Island looked like. Now you look to the left. Here's the ferry. This is uh, now, it's, it's the Gulf, Gulf Copper Fabrication Yard. So that, that was built uh, just a couple of years earlier than that. Oh, no, that was built in the uh, 1970s on it. I've got the wrong date. And, and here's that yard. This was taken about 1973 under construction. It's 210 acres on it. And a lot of the offshore vessels, not vessels, but the production platforms that are in the Gulf of Mexico uh, were built out, out of this yard. Uh, that platform right there is the Bullwinkle platform. That's over 1,000 feet long. That base is... Uh, about as tall as a 20-story building on it, with it, and um, that was done in the 1970s. They'd bring barges in, they, they put them in there, and then they skidded, it's on what's called a skidway, onto the barges, take it off out into the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, uh, put it in place there. These are some other platforms that were made in, in that same era, the, uh, they're not as the magnitude of Bullwinkle, but uh, that yard, it, at its peak, had five, 500 to 800 people working there. Uh, after that, uh, we, we saw that the, the last time the channel was deepened was uh, in the 1960s. Well, in 1972, we were starting to import oil again with it. And uh, they said, well, let's, let's go to a deep, we need a deeper channel on there. And they called it Deep Port. And the, the plan for Deep Port was to be 72 feet deep on there. And it met a lot of opposition here from Port Aransas. We had uh, the owner of the South Jetty at the time, was Steve Frischman, with there. And the, and the community, it, it was a big project. And the community got, uh, they didn't like it. Um, with it, and uh, in 1976, the oil market changed. And so between the opposition, you, and you also changed, you had Gerald Ford in office in, at that time, and then Jimmy Carter was there, and so the, this project was abandoned. And it, that's hard to see uh, on it. Uh, Harbor Island is, is up on the left. You see the Gulf of Mexico. They were gonna relocate about 1,000 feet of the North Jetty. And then the next plan, so it was 1976, that went down the tubes. And then the next uh, plan was called Superport. And Superport was going to be 60 feet deep, not as deep as the 72 is, is deep port. And they were going to have some slips uh, where you could put a boom across it. And the economics on it was going to cost $500 million to build Superport. And the refiners, they were asked, uh, hey, guys, do you want to sign on for this? Do you want to promise that uh, you'll give us the tariffs and bring it in? They said, yeah, it's a little bit rich for us. And, and so Superport went down the tubes. Now, this, this is a current. Uh, well, this isn't current. This is frac sand. Uh, this, this is a product that's recently coming in. It, it hadn't come in lately, but Canyonport uh, had, had the Harbor Island uh, facility before that. So they were bringing sand in, coming up down to Mississippi from the Midwest, going to frack the uh, Eagleford oil on there. This is Gulf Coast copper today with it. We all drive by it. You see to the left, that's uh, wind turbines coming in there. You can see some pipe, uh, that old rusty looking pipe out there. That's going to the uh, new Exxon or the Gulf Coast Joint Ventures, that's going to be piling for it. Here's pipe going out to the Permian Basin on there. Uh, and and there also, we all know the big rigs that they have on there. They're bringing in other product besides that uh, with it too. So it, it's a real active and going port. Uh, if, if we'd look just up to the left, we'd see uh, Porpoise Point, uh, those others. So that, that's kind of kind of the history, and Port Aransas, it's got its name because it's a port. And it, as we're looking at the future, we all know that um, the environment is so critical to us. But we got here 
where we came from was being a port. That's what created the jobs. That's what got the name for it. And it's something we don't really, the, uh, the Harbor Island tankage, those oil tanks, they were ceased uh, using them in, in 1993 with it. Uh, and it's in, in history how things are always evolving. Originally, we brought oil in from Mexico. Then we were exporting oil. Harbor Island, when it closed in 1993 on there, you had Atlantic Richfield, American, or, or uh, Phoenix uh, Corporation, and, and Humble Oil and Refining, Exxon. They were bringing oil in. It was going to refineries, uh, uh, Three Rivers Refiners and other refiners. And now we're looking at maybe that, uh, we brought it in, we sent it out, we brought it in at some point in time, we may be bringing it back out again uh, with it. And just in, in the changes that we've done, we all just come here and we en enjoy so much of what we have, but if we look back that uh, those folks, those pioneers who were building those jetties and taking the hours that it took to come here with it and investing that, you know, the millions of dollars to make it make it grow, I, my hat's always off to them with it. And just from my perspective, that uh, we really cherish our environment here, and, and anything we do, uh, I, I think we need to respect that on there. But you can respect in the environment, and we've got to live too. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. But anyway, thank you very much, and I'm glad to answer any questions. Uh, Yeah. yeah, at the uh, at the Whoopi Crane Festival, there was a group of Porter Ramses people who had a group, and they were uh, passing out petitions to oppose the development of Harbor Island. Did you say a few words about that? <laughs> From an environmental <laughs> I, 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 I'm here. I'm, I'm here to talk about the past, but I, if, if any development does happen, I, th I hope it will be done, I, it will be done if it happens in a responsible manner uh, on there. So you've got, you know, how history repeats. We can go back to 1972 with the deep port. There's not that much difference. This is actually, it's, it's three feet deeper than deep port, but it doesn't have as much to do as far as channel changes and, and those kind of things. So I, I tell people, just go back to deep port. Uh, you, you can find your arguments on both sides right there, whichever side you want to take. Yeah. In there. Yeah. It's going, they are building pipelines like mad right now to the Permian Basin. Uh, there is so much oil sitting there. The Permian Basin is Midland. It's about 500 miles from here. And uh, there's several pipelines being built with it. And these are billion dollar pipelines. Uh, well, they're, good. they're going to the, uh, some are going to Ingleside, uh, going to Corpus Christi, some are going to the Houston area. The, to me, being a Texan, I never thought we would be where we are today with the amount of oil with what fracking has unleashed. Uh, it is 2019, the United States has surpassed Saudi Arabia exporting oil uh, on there. And, and with oil, you've got natural gas, and you've got natural gas liquids. So. With, it, with a pipeline, you need one for your natural gas, you need another one for your oil on there, and your liquids you can kind of mix in between. If you go out to Midland area, in that area right now, you see these flares everywhere. They're, they're burning that natural gas. That valuable natural gas is just going up in smoke. And because the natural gas pipelines, they're pumping oil, the more valuable oil in there, because there's just not enough room. And uh, West Texas Intermediate, the crude that's produced out there, is selling at a $12 discount because there's not enough capacity to get it out. So, in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do they do with the material they drift? Uh, spoil banks uh, on there. And 
If you look at pictures of our bays today versus the old uh, charts, they're, they're very different uh, with it. If Let's take the ship channel. You've you got these big islands high on either side. That's the spoil uh, out of them. And they start at the Inner Harbor in Corpus Christi. You've got them along Ingleside. You've got them Turtle Cove uh, here. Now, if they're dredging the from the jetties out, a lot of times they'll use a hopper dredge and they'll, the disposal areas are out in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so they, you got two, two manners, a hopper dredge as they load it up in the hopper, take it out and, and dump it. And then most dredging is hydraulic dredging where they have a, they're pumping it out. They've got this big auger and the water sucking in and about it's 20% uh, solid and the rest water, that's hydraulic dredging. Most of the dredging taking place in the bays is hydraulic, all of it is really. Hmm? Is that loaded aboard ship and dumped also in the bay? No, no, no. Once, once you build these uh, spoil islands, they're, they're there. Uh, with it. it's, it's fun going through the old uh, pictures and see how they change over time. Uh, you know, that, that's a lecture in itself right there. But uh, the bays are very much different now. Yeah. You might mention, Joe, about the authorization of deepening the channel is occurred right now. Uh, okay, so... I, I'm talking about uh, going down to 75 feet. The contracts have already been awarded dredging the channel down. The, the dredge boat supposedly is on its way to take the channel down to 54 feet, up to the ferry landings with it. So it, it, the stuff you read about in the paper is a little bit different. That's the deep water on there, the super tanker port. Uh, the, and all the environmental work has been done, and, and like I say, the contract has been let, uh, the money's been appropriated, uh, that's going to happen. So that's, that's going down to 54, and 45 is the authorized depth, the actual depth is uh, 47, they usually overdredge a couple of feet. Yeah. Yeah, uh, on it, but it, it's it's pretty tough to remove them, and uh, so what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to go through wetlands on there, cut them up, or whatever. My my guess is those barges are there to stay. They will. Uh, that area of St. Joe's Island will be rich in iron oxide as they rust away. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Say in what happens to Harbor Island? Well, they had the Navy, uh, the Navy station, Ingles, uh, Navy base Ingleside, which was a ship base, and it was closed down, and now it's an oil terminal. The Naval Air Station, uh, they dredged a channel to it during World War II, but it filled in, and, and no ships call on the Naval Air Station. So our n naval presence here is strictly aviation uh, with it. I, and it, as far, uh, I, I, I found out the politician in me, the Navy says what Washington wants it to say. And as administrations change, what the Navy says is different. So. Uh, Thank you all very much. Don't forget, if you haven't signed in, please sign in at one of the tables. And uh, also, there's donation jars. We depend on your donations. Thank you for coming.